Yes, yes, we have liftoff. Thank you again for tuning in to the Big Truth Podcast, episode three. I'm here with my man, Lenny Lashley, who you may know from such acts as Doc Buster, Street Dogs, just was on tour for a while with CJ Ramon playing guitar. Yeah. And also, you know, Lenny Lashley's Gang of One. New record out with that not pretty, too long ago. Pretty much anybody will have me. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, just Boston uh, punk rock guy and legend in the uh, in the world over here. So um, we got him on today, and we're just going to talk a little bit about what's going on and who he is, where he came from, and how we got to where he's where he's at right now and where he thinks he's going. Shit. <laughs> 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 well, where do you start there? I'm, I know where I'm at right now, staring at a a red red solo cup full of frangelico. <laughs> Only the best, my friend. You know, I'm a very distinguished gentleman over here, you know. You know Certainly a sipping a cordial <laughs> as we as we talk as as, as men. <laughs> Just kidding. Um but yeah, man, so you know uh, for people that might not be as familiar with us, uh, f- familiar with you, uh, just give me a little bit of background, like, you know, where you're from, you know, uh, how you ended up getting into the punk rock stuff and kind of just go from there and we can we can just. Uh... Well, I grew up in like the South Shore, uh, not far from here, uh, Kingston, Mass, just the other side of the State Forest, really. Uh, and the Freetown Freetown State Forest. No, the no, Miles Standy's not the. <laughs> I'm just playing. <laughs> That's the other way. You, so you didn't have uh, uh, satanic ritual killings and puckwudgies and, and uh, phoenixes rising from the. Uh, or no, did, no, you know what we had was a a, a fucking uh, cold case murder that went on for what was a, a. You probably heard of that. That, but there was a girl Tracy Gilpin that was a few years younger than my little brother. She uh, disappeared. And uh, recently, they just recently got the guy that did it. it was twenty years, but wow. her her sister, her sister wound up going on to be the the, what's the biggest thing you can be in the state state police, chief, yeah, like a blue or, or something above that. Yeah, it was like a, but she pretty much devoted her whole life to chasing this dude down. And then when we discovered who it was, wow, it was pretty freaky because it was nobody we had suspected. But oh. so. Uh, like real horror stories. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now, wait, now, was that, did they find her? Or they, was she just missing? She went missing, but they did find her in, okay. in, uh, in Miles Standish, and she had been bludgeoned with a, like an 11 pound rock or something. It was really horrific. Yeah. And then they, uh, wow, we got off to a weird start. <laughs> I was, and you know what I was just thinking is like, this ties into another thing from my youth is that, uh, where my father lived when we were kids, uh, when I was a kid, uh, he was in Dartmouth, and he was in the woods. Was right behind his house, yeah. and that's where they found two of the bodies from the New Bedford Highway killing. Like literally, like the woods I used to play in behind his house when I was a kid, and uh, you, it, that was that was a weird one too. You know, are what you I mean? sure you were a kid? <laughs> yeah, well, I was like fourteen. <laughs> you know, what? and this is what a, a asshole I was because at that time it was you know crazy. You know, everyone, what the fuck's going on here? Yeah. Like they were finding bodies left and right, right on you know one ninety five and. He he lived off near the Reed Road exit, and I know they found like two right there. Was that the New Bedford uh, Eleven or whatever? The New Bedford Twelve or something? They had yeah that? the highway killings. Yeah. Well, they called it the highway killings because that's where the bodies were drunk. Yeah. But well, it was they, prostitutes and yeah, stuff. Yeah, they were killing uh, hookers off of Purchase Street and uh, you, the Purchase Street area and uh, 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 Weld Square, or whatever, and then down there, drop dump dumping them down there. But so when I was a kid, <laughs> little punk skateboarder fucking asshole, all I remember is that. Uh, one of my friends was hanging around, and uh, we were we were walking by there, and cars were coming, and I just threw her over my shoulder and ran in the woods. Oh, Jesus Christ. <laughs> People were, like, skidding and scratch, like, screeching the halls because they thought they just saw, like, the killer run in the woods with a body. Like, just... I feel like things – I feel like not a lot's changed with you, that seems like. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, that's, that's you know, that's uh, – and then, you, you know, Ryan uh, at, at the tattoo yeah, shop, yeah. my boy Ryan, he still has some of the – we we stole all the, the the police tape from from the crime scene. No kidding. He has a bunch of it still wrapped up somewhere. We got, we we had some fucked up buttes, huh? Because there was another one too in Kingston. There was a you. I don't know if you remember Meinholz. You remember that name at all? I, I, it sounds familiar. He he was a guy. That, well, I went to. I used to ride the bus with his daughters, and uh, he wound up 
grabbing some girl in a in a cemetery in Kingston and been killing her in his basement or something. It was it, we had a couple of weird things going on. Maybe, yeah, yeah the South Coast Massachusetts had it. A little bit of griminess to it. And New Bedford had big more, dans and yeah. all that shit. Yeah, a little more griminess than most. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it was America's city. At the, <laughs> that's the beauty of it. At the time where all that bullshit was going on, it got crowned America's city for what some reason. Well, I like a whaling city sounds much better than America's city anyway. Yeah, I think America's city is just some award they give to like diverse communities or something. Just sounds make like everyone, it, everyone like it, feel better it about it. should be in Iowa. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. New Bedford's definitely, uh, yeah, definitely... Like you said, uh, definitely uh, more of a, a, a grimy. Uh, the, the whaling city was pretty accurate because pretty much after the whaling industry died, so did the city. Yeah. Yeah, but it's coming back. It feels like, to me, historically, like I always think of uh, of like Moby Dick. Wasn't that based? What, was that? No. So in Moby Dick, Herman Melville calls New Bedford a really gritty, grimy place oh, in the 1800s. Like, he, he talks about New Bedford really quick. So Nantucket is something that was yeah was written on. But, yeah, I remember there was reference to New Bedford or something. Yeah, and it was just talking about, like, that was a shithole even back then. So <laughs> no no, no disrespect to the uh, citizenry of and, and, and uh, people of New Bedford. No, it's, it's coming it's, up anyway. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that's that's where I grew up as a kid, and that's— I know, love it down here. I, I spent— m- Many years, day after day, down here playing pool. Have some of my best friends that yeah. that I ever met. Yeah, right up the road you did. Acu- Acubillions, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so anyway, yeah. So uh, before we got derailed with talk of uh, morbid situations <laughs> of <laughs> death, <laughs> death, <laughs> southern Un- southern Massachusetts death, unsolved murders, <laughs> unsolved murders, and and whatnot. And by the way, just if if anyone's interested, there is a book about, and I just forgot the name, of it, and I read it like a year ago about the New Bedford Highway killings. And it's a really interesting book. I'm interested in that. And uh, I'll dig it up later, and in the show notes, I'll put a link to it or something. That'd be um, cool. And uh, it was a really cool book, and uh, it got into some really weird, weird things, especially with one guy, because um, there was two. They never figured out who it was, but there was two suspects. One of them was a lawyer from New Bedford, a guy named Kenneth Pont, and the other guy was a dude that lived right up the road, and. Um, they went to go arrest him, and he had killed himself or something right up the road in uh, in Freetown here. Huh. Uh, so Freetown has its little share of, of, of oddities, too. It's you, the woods, you know, and it's a, it's old old New England swamp Yankee woods. I love it, man. I, Me, I, too. This is, the, this is the place, man, to be. As much as I love, you know, when Chopperhead first started, we were in South Boston, right on Gold Street, uh, with our friend Ken and Jerry had a, a garage, and they let us in on, and that's where we started. And then we actually moved here to this building in about 2001. Yep. And we rented out just this part of it. Yep. And then we were supposed to get the back area. That's the big garage. And then uh, that uh, didn't happen. So we moved to the mills in New Bedford and then bought our other building on Jenny Street. And then this building was up for sale. We were riding around here and I mean, I used and to bought ride, it. I used to ride by here to, to go to Accu all the time. I remember, yeah. I remember this building yeah. from, from then. And, you know, the beautiful beautiful thing about this is just, like you said, test riding a customer bike. We come out of here, hook a left, and we're on these woods, woods backwoods roads, hugging lakes and yeah. off in the forest, and it's, it's fucking awesome. It's yeah, not, it's some good and, riding. <laughs> yeah. On a, in our shop in New Bedford on Jenny Street, we hook a left, and we're running through the projects and craziness and mad traffic and stoplights and whatever. And so... Good for a first ride, like a guy that's never ridden a bike. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's pretty much how how Packer sent me on my way when he gave me my first four-hour lesson on a motorcycle. (laughs) And then said, okay, go to work. He's doing that because one of the first times I rode with him, he was still new. Were you with me too? Or was that? I I was with you the first time I ever was on the highway on a motorcycle. We were splitting lanes and being retards and stuff. I I, I keep saying retards and I'm going to get in trouble because most people don't realize when we say it here, we're talking about ourselves and not anyone mentally disabled or anything. So, wow, you've already gone with the politically correct disclaimers on here. Dude, I did the same thing on the last episode with Johannes and, and, uh, (laughs) and it's only, I don't even think about it except that when me and Paco were at, uh, um, Mama tried last year. We literally got in a fist fight in a hotel at like five in the morning. We've been drinking from like noon till five in the morning. Somebody didn't like the word. And Packer dropped the R bomb 
And we ended up, he ended up getting a fist oh, fight with God, the dude, yeah. <laughs> but it was a 5 a.m. drunk ass fist fight. <laughs> so it was, it, it was nothing spectacular. Oh, all I remember is Packer took his own shirt off and was all pissed off. And, and then they got, in a, they got in a tussle and the lady's like, dude, the guy got my shirt off. I was like, nah, dude, that was <laughs> you, you. That was you. You did that one on your own, bud. But anyway, we digress. So let's talk a little bit about Mr. Lashley here. Be like, as it, you know, you know, how did you find, well, you know, like getting into music, obviously music's a huge part of your life. That's what you do. So like, you know, how did you get into that? And then how'd you find your way into punk rock and all that stuff? Well, uh, I mean, I feel like, like music was just something that I really was drawn to as a young kid. Uh, whether it was driving around with my mother in a, in a shitbox Mustang that she had, you know, and listening to AM radio, it, it was just something that I really identified with. And, uh, I think at one point she she got me into like I I remember fourth and fifth grade kind of playing flute and tri town band until till the, the, the <laughs> till the guy that ran ran the whole thing figured out I couldn't read music and embarrassed me and I pretty much decided that flute would never be cool anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I've just I had such good visuals of you playing the flute. Yeah, like fucking it, Jethro Tull. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> One foot up on the desk. Yeah, it was you, nothing like that at all. You gotta bring it back. You gotta bring it I've thought about trying to play it again. Jethro Tull meets Ron Burgundy meets Lenny Lashley. <laughs> Let's do it, dude. It's too too much too technical for me anyway, you know. Thundergun thirteen sixty nine, you've been you've been moved from guitar to jazz flute. Oh, a rock flute. I feel like we could work something out there where I could do a, like a a bit of a solo as long as it involves <laughs> as long as it involves stepping on tables and stuff. Do they make a neck holder for a flute like how they do for a harmonica so you could play guitar and have the flute? I think that it'd have to be like a like one of those separate stands that just holds it. We can make one for I you. I think here. They, you might be right. They might they they may have something like that. I feel like that's something that, that Jethro Tell could use, you know what mm. I mean? I saw Jethro Tull, and he just held it. There was no. He likes flute. to tuck it under the arm like yeah. a little staff too, or something, right? Yeah, or like a majorette. There was no, there was no flute stand <laughs> it's a, it's a, at Jethro Tull's thirtieth uh, anniversary or whatever it was that I went to. This was twenty years. He's ago. probably got a guy. He's got a guy, a flute guy, <laughs> a, a flute tech guy comes up, <laughs> grabs the flute. Imagine that your whole your whole industry career, like as a as like a tech, and you end up as Jethro Tull's flute. You tech. just polish the shit out of that thing. Yeah, man, you polish it. The, the flute have flute doesn't have like a reed or anything, does it? No, just a hole. Just a hole. <laughs> you just blow into the hole, buddy. You got to purse your lips. <laughs> <laughs> Pucker up and blow in the hole. <laughs> <laughs> so, so. I got a whole, you know, shop back there with welders, a lathe. Are you saying you're going to make me a stand for a I'm flute? I'm going to make a flute fucking stand <laughs> so that you can so that you can play guitar. I sold the flute for a guitar anyway because I figured it out was cool. I don't have a flute. I'm not spending money on a fucking flute. Oh, look at that. That's the police checking on us. Yeah, they know about the podcast. <laughs> They're like, the lights are on. What are they doing? <laughs> but um, uh, the, so, so as we got to... As we got derailed, which is probably going to be happening more than once. I would this. figure. So you got in. So you 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 started listening to music, and then you you ju you dived into the flute. Yeah, headlong. It's a double. I mean, it was like a, head fucking first. Yeah, I was like flute, <laughs> flute boy, <laughs> flute flute Skywalker. I get. I mean, I, I I don't know how we made that transition. I guess it was just that my mother wanted to get me involved in the music. She was always kind of. Uh, uh, ex exposing me and my brother to stuff like that, you know, and uh, and and wanting to kind of, you know, broaden our horizons, so to speak. And uh, <clears throat> well, eventually, when I figured out the flute was pretty uh, gay <laughs> or reti oh. or retarded. <laughs> Oh boy, you already you're gonna have a coalition of of hate against me already, yeah. dude. Well, I mean, it's it, um, we're not gonna get into the why or why not. I don't mean, but I don't mean sexual orientation, I and know, I don't I mean know, I it's know. it's weird that some of the words that were like like the biggest jabs from when we were a kid that I never meant towards anybody of of any like you said uh, specific gender or specific sexual orientation or specific. Or, or whatever, it's just those words are gone, man. You wouldn't even say it to somebody that you didn't like. It was only no. to people that you like, only yeah. to friends that you'd said it to. So, it was, so it was 
That, that kind of stuff was a term of endearment almost, you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. Well, that's the thing about the East Coast that a lot of people don't understand, or specifically with a lot of us, is like, until we're busting your balls, like, we probably don't like you. Like, that's like, when you get your balls busted, that means you're kind of in. You yeah. know what I mean? Like, that means, <laughs> all right, it's cool. Like, these are, we're cool. Like, you know what I mean? But anyway, but going on to that, just as a disclaimer here, Lenny Lashy is also the guy that has a record that says, all are welcome. So, yeah, and so, I truly <laughs> believe, I, I truly believe that. I mean, yeah. I, I, I I, I don't want to get into semantics about it, but I, everybody is welcome in my book, and it doesn't give you any entitlement over anybody else anyway either it, yeah. in that in that regard. So if, if what's good for the goose is good for the gander, and that's how it should be, you know what I mean? So uh, so you yeah. can send your hate mail later to, I'll give you the post office box or something, you know. <laughs> at, at Lenny Lashley, Instagram. <laughs> so, no, but uh, but going back to it, so... You found out you you played the flute. Found out the flute wasn't for you. Right, you, exactly. You, 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 went, you got a kazoo. You went to the flute. You went to the slide whistle. And, and then fortunately, I, I mean, I played guitar. I think I I took some lessons. So uh, right after the flute, you went over to guitar. My mother my mother had an old guitar that she she made a she was pretty smart and she didn't want me to kind of bail on a new on a new electric or something. So she made me prove. She made a made me swear to her that I would learn, prove to her that I could play this old homie that she had. And, uh, you know, I, I, I did the whole fingers practically bleeding until I could play a tune for her. I don't know. I don't know how long it took. Was it, was it, <sighs> was it deep purple? No, nah, I did learn that, that <laughs> smoke on the water. Really? Yeah, yeah. It's not a myth. It really know, is. The, it's like the first song that anybody else ever learned. It was no. It was I had like three three chords I could play, which is still like the basic what I can do: to G and a D and an E chord or something, you know. And uh, she remembers what song and everything because mothers do that stuff. I don't even remember. But then we traded the flute for uh, for a get electric. Once I proved I could do that, excuse me. And uh, and fortunately, at the time where we lived in Rocky Nook. Uh, there were some older kids. It was a family of uh, of Irish kids, the O'Hallorans, that uh, everybody pretty much in the in the family played. So I could go down and hang out four four or five houses down, and somebody would be there that would go like, "Oh, you want to learn how to play a little bit of Over the Hills and Far Away by Led Zeppelin?" Or, and that's kind of how it how it uh, went, you know. For I didn't really play out. I think in a band, I played like some some keg parties as a teenager and stuff like that, you know, but nothing really out, out until I was in my twenties. <clears throat> and then I fell into, uh, Brockton had a real good scene. So before that, like what, what were you listening to? Like, I know you just mentioned you were playing some Led Zeppelin or whatever. Well, but. I mean, I really listened to whatever, like I learned whatever they were willing to teach, you know, the, the oldest brother, Jimmy had, he was stationed. I remember he was stationed in Germany and, uh, eventually he came back and he, he was, all gaga about a little band called ACDC that nobody knew who who they were over here at the time. And he had some import albums and he was raving about them. So I think it was like uh, Dog Eat Dog. He knew the, the riff. He knew some riffs to some of that stuff that I'd picked up on. And and then, uh, you know, what? like as kids in the South Shore, we didn't really get exposed to a lot of punk rock at the time. We were we were listening to Aerosmith or the the, the mainstream kind of stuff that was on, but a friend of mine in the neighborhood, uh, Billy Tringali had an older brother that had uh, Rocket to Russia, the Ramones Rocket to Russia, and I remember that something clicked, and I realized that, that that's probably where I should, what I should be concentrating on, because it, was, it wasn't too cerebral for me. It was something that I could get my head around and do, and, and, uh, and I really clicked with that, and then I, my mother was real cool too. I think at 16 we could take, I could take like a PB Plymouth and Brockton bus from the end of the road and go all the way into South station and see shows at the channel. As long as I got home. All right. I mean, it was a different time then can't, can't really do that now. Sure. No, it's crazy. Two things that you just mentioned that like, I think pretty much resonate with everybody that found like punk rock or hardcore or, or thrash metal or whatever. It's like, you just hear that one song, the first song you hear and you just, it just clicks. Like, it's not even like, yeah, no, that's cool. It's like all of a sudden it clicks like, yeah, that's. I mean, I can remember the song on that, but it was like, Do You Want to Dance, which wasn't even a Ramones. It was like a cover song that they yeah. did, you know? I, I, uh, <clears throat> uh, side note, I have, 
I have the Ramones Rocket to Russia is the only punk rock eight track I have for my Lincoln when I'm in the Continental, <laughs> the 66. So that's, that's, that's what I got on pretty much that or Hank Williams. But, but, uh, you know, for me, it was like, I remember distinctly being in middle school and listening to the local college radios, uh, UMass, Stop- well, it was Southern, it was WSMU. They used to be SMU, Southern Massachusetts yeah. University. Then it changed to UMass Dartmouth. And on one of their shows, they were playing uh, suicidal, institutionalized. But this is, you know, when it came out. Right. When I was in middle school, yeah. and I remember they just were like, I heard that, and I was like, oh, shit, that's that's absolutely, that's me. Pretty, that's- pretty strong guitar riff, right? You know, like throughout that one. It's, it draws you in, you know? But it's weird. It's But it's like you said, like a like a switch flips, and it's just like, yep, that's that's it. What is this? And this is this is it. And then from there on, it just goes. And then... You know what I mean? That it's just funny that you know every a lot of people I've talked to like that really got into the music. It was like literally one they, the first time they heard it. It's just a switch flips, and you're like, "Yep, that's it." I mean, that was true to the like. I remember going. I must have been sixteen or seventeen. She she my mother let me go. Like I said, to shows, and I distinctly remember seeing them, the Ramones, at like Spit on Lansdowne Street, and it was. I mean, I was by myself as a kid and my ears literally rang for like three days after. And then I really was hooked. Then I was like, well, something, this is, this is something crazy now. You're like, yeah, absolutely. And it's crazy too. Like it was a different world. Like I remember being 16 and me and my friend, Pat Burke, we took the bus from Boston to New York city to go see sheer terror and the nihilistics. Well, the Ni- sheer terror opened up for the nihilistics Jeez. at CBGB's. And then like, you know, we stayed, we slept in the port authority <laughs> it took the the bus home the the first six a.m. bus, and you know what I mean. Like so you're always taking it to another level. They'd never do that. Man, sixteen. Well, no. sixteen isn't that bad. But I remember when we were fourteen. Like my father, uh, Ryan, Ryan uh, Hasrock, uh, yeah. Iron Ryan. Yeah. Like his parents would drop us off at shows, and then my father would come pick us up in Providence. Like I, we saw the Ramones at, at the living room, uh, and the first show we ever saw was. In between eighth grade and freshman year, and I mentioned this last one too, was suicidal and Jerry's kids at the living room. And you imagine dropping a fourteen year old off like in a in a city like forty minute half hour away to go see a punk rock show, and you, you drop them off. And back then shows were a little more chaotic. Yeah, and no doubt. People were like crazy in and the parking lot. You know what I mean? Things like, were crazier too, I think. But I mean, it's funny because I, I think like my mother did a great job of raising me, and most of the I mean. Really, to her credit, she did a fucking great job raising two kids on her own and putting herself through college. She did all she could. But the, some of the things that she did probably would have had us taken away from her nowadays. You know what I mean? And it's like, I think that that was, that's kind of weird because that was instrumental in kind of shaping me as a person, you know? That's one thing I think that in general is crazy because like, like in this day and age, when you're a kid, like... You, it's so much more like draconian now. Like when we were kids, we were free to wander, man. Like I remember being inside, being home was a fucking punishment. Like you did everything you could to be out. But we didn't have one of these to stare at all the time. Well, yeah, too, exactly. You know I mean? so. It's it's like there's there's two things. There's there's all these devices and video games and whatever. And I'm not trying to sound like the old bro, 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 but it's true. Like when we were kids, we were out riding our bikes around, going in the woods, going to, riding around the city, wherever we lived. You know, I, I spent first half of my youth in New Bedford and the second half in Dartmouth. And Dartmouth was more like a neighborhood with woods in the background. Right. And, and, and uh, you know, we were out all day. And then you come home at when you're supposed to come home or whatever for dinner or whatever. And then you tried to go out some more. Like, and, and, and like that wanderlust, I think, is like, is killed now. It's stifled. By these cell phones or like, I mean, it's kind of scary the culture right? now. Like, like you know what I mean? Like, because we, as a species, right? We try and le- that's that's how we, l- we we learn stuff. You know what yeah. I mean? You learn stuff by experience, right? You know what I mean? And like, it. if you take that away from kids, and it's then you get this this uh, insular kind of I don't even know how to describe it, but it's definitely a different mentality. You know? No, absolutely, and and, and it's just you know, it's sad because like. I think, I think we came from cool generations where we get to have, have experienced both. And so, uh, like we know what it's like, like to live before 
cell phones and internet and this and that. And it's not having, gonna not gonna be anymore probably soon. No, right? no. But like we could, we know how to navigate out in the world without that. Like we used to take long trips, like go to shows in New York without GPS. Without of course, I did the first quest. first tour I ever did of the U.S. I mean, we were doing a how to book your own life and a and an atlas. Yeah, yeah, road atlas is like we. I think I still have one in my truck just from from back in the day. Like you know, even back when we first started Chopper and we'd go to like Arizona or we'd go to different places and pick up parts and stuff. We, we still had maps and shit. Like, yeah. and then when MapQuest came out, you still printed it out. Yeah. <laughs> and then and now it's cool. Like I use GPS to find dumb shit where I kind of even know where I'm going, but now I have it on just to see Short the red, cut, to see the cuts. traffic yeah. or, or shortcuts right. or, or whatever. It's like, but you don't want to get too dependent on it, you know, because if if it ever goes down, what are you going to do? I mean, I feel like that's, like, we're sidetracked again, but I feel like that's the way that they want us to be is, is dumbed down and dependent on stuff, to be honest. You know what I mean? And it's like, sure. we're not thinking for ourselves. It's Ryan, actually, I think one of the first times I took a ride, a ride on the bike with him, and he, he didn't have a place to put his phone or something. And I remember he had taped directions onto the tank or something. Yeah, that's what we used to do. I, I thought, still have done that in the last few I'm years. Like, what? I, well, I was new to it, and I'm like, wow, that's pretty smart because I'd be driving around asking for the stop and asking for directions. Or like, yeah, yeah. But it's, 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 it's a matter of being resourceful, you know what I mean? Yeah. Which I'm not a Luddite. I mean, I believe that you could use it. you got to use the technology that's there. Sure. But uh, – but there's a difference between using it and it using you, you know. So sure, absolutely, or 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 being uh, uh, manipulated or controlled by it. Not to get into any weird world or, or conspiracies. It's not that at all. I think it's just a lot of times like corporations or people, these companies that make apps and make phones and make hardware and software. They they make money off of, you know. Do, doing that stuff like getting you hooked on their product like you know what i mean and, like the and, like the road mixing board and mics yeah. that we're speaking into <laughs> yeah, yeah. right now for while, while we segue into advertisement sure i i am not sponsored by them i purchased this with my own money so well i you, guarantee you it'll show up in our instagram feed a little later on tonight my yeah friend. yeah you're gonna get ads for for road procaster mics or whatever <laughs> um but anyway yeah so so Starting at a young age, you found music. You started. You you started getting into guitar, and then you started uh, playing in some like high school bands or something. Yeah, we played like little parties, and it was just cover covers, Black Sabbath covers, and that kind of stuff. Even though I was writing my own music, we we kind of gravitated towards what. I mean, it was partying. We were out partying and hanging with people, and eventually, I think I must have been twenty seven or twenty six or twenty seven. Uh. I started go. I was in a. I formed a band, a little three piece with a guy that was a bass player. We always had a difficulty getting a steady drummer, but we had a band, and uh, we started hanging at a place. Derringer's in Brockton was on Route 28, and uh, that was the first time I really kind of was part of a, a music scene. You know, there's a guy. There was a sound guy there that was really great mentor for young kids that were coming around, you know, people that were playing this guy, JJ, he's still, he's still involved in music. I, he does, he does some charitable stuff for kids to uh, keep them in music. But, uh, you know, so then we were exposed to a bands from all over the place. There were bands, uh, metal bands from the North shore. And there was a, ba I remember there was a band thought junkie actually was a real good band from Freetown. Uh, they used to make the trip. They were like a three piece and I got to be friends with them. And, and a lot of those bands were, we're playing gigs too in town and, and, and elsewhere. And so I started slowly going and following bands like that out to, to gigs that they had at Bun Ratties or wherever. And, and this when shows were still kind of more mixed. Like I remember like when I was a kid, shows would be, there'd be like a hardcore band, a punk band, a metal band. Well, Brockton rock. was, it's, it's funny because Brockton always had that. There was a hardcore, there was a hardcore undercurrent that was at pretty much all the shows was a triple triple x guys and there was a whole but yeah it was super diverse i mean there was a band mystery jones i don't even i remember they just all wore like black turtlenecks they were really out there and then there was a band like there was a band from the north shore uh bad blood i think the name of the band was but they would legit like come down in a limousine every to every gig like and show up like they were hair metal dudes you know like but we'd go to every it didn't matter who was playing because it was a, it really was a scene we'd go and see that was where we went every night to see whatever was playing and whatever band was playing. And I think, I mean, that was kind of, that was important in the, in a music scene, a community. I don't see that so much anymore. 
What what time frame was that? Was that like eighties, late eighties, or? Early? I guess it had to be probably early, like late eighties, early nineties, or something. You know what I mean? Because sure. I had a band Swaggeroon that was, yeah, I guess that must have been ninety ninety two, ninety three, something like that. Because Doc Buster started playing in like ninety six or so, I guess. Uh, and that was really. All the punk rock stuff, which was really what I was gravitating towards anyway, the stuff I was playing with John in this band Swag Room was more, he was really into like Primus and he was into some 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 grungy kind of stuff. So our stuff was really pretty much out there. It was really melodic, but, but kind of free form, not really formatted. And I remember I had started writing stuff that was more in the, in the kind of punk rocky kind of vibe. And it wasn't really where he wanted to go. It was a volatile relationship we had anyway. I think we had a couple of falling outs. And I remember one time we, we had a drummer in a practice space and he he uh, was getting lippy about something at practice and hiding behind the drum kit like nothing could happen to him. So I just like dove through the drum kit at the kid. <laughs> and he didn't play with us anymore after that. So, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's, so that was, yeah, that was how it went really. You know what I mean? Till Till Doc Buster, and then we started kind of making some moves and, and, and playing VFWs was really big at the time. There were VFW shows all over at that time. The, the punk scene was really was really something in Boston at, at that time, in those days, you know? Yeah, like I, I um, what I remember about Doc Buster is that the shows were always pretty rowdy. I mean, shit, I just watched some, some, some footage uh, doing like a YouTube search for one song that we'd never really recorded called Mr. Naughty that CJ always asks about. So I looked and there's footage of the finals in the, the, the rumble that we won in 2000. And it's six, it's like a six or eight minute long clip and it's towards the end of it. So I, you got to watch the whole thing and it's, I can't believe the chaos that was going on yeah. like now looking at it. And I, I was in the middle of it, you know, like I'm wearing Budweiser shorts and, there's just, I mean, oceans of beer flying around. Yeah, that's pretty much what I remember. It, it was more beer in the air than there was in the cups. I mean, it, it was insane when I think about that. You know? Yeah. What do you? What do you? What do you think? Because you don't see that a lot anymore, and I've always been a fan of like rowdy punk rock. And and what do you think? Like like how to get like that? Like you know what I mean? Because when you listen to that, it is it is like fun music. You know what I mean? And it's very catchy and sing along. I, th I think if I had to think about like wh the why and the hows of it is because we had a, because we had developed a little bit of a buzz with folks that were playing and were around in the scene, but we had a large contingent of, of towny uh, South Shore, uh, for lack of a better word. I mean, think of what I'd say right now. Yeah. But, but but townies, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, so my, like the beer throwing thing, I think me and my brother used to have these. You remember the show Jackass? Me and my brother had that show before they ever televised it. Like we would be at a party together and just wildly open slap each other in the face until like we knocked two teeth loose and and the beer fights and all of that stuff. And he really was, he would come and just, you know, cause mayhem really, yeah, you know? Yeah. I, I, I remember for the Rumble... That was a big thing with us too. Like before, I remember I saved up with the choppers. Right? Well, even before the choppers, like when we were kids, I saved up. I worked the whole summer so I could buy a video camera so I could film us doing dumb shit. Yeah. And literally, that was before Jackass even yeah. was a thing or Camp Kill Yourself was a thing. It was just, I think in that time frame, there was a lot of like minded kids. We yeah. were just fucking rowdy as fuck. And yeah, I mean, maybe it was we the bugs. For maybe it was all the bugs money we watched as kids, you yeah, know? Yeah, man. So, but we were going, we were doing dumb ass shit. Like, I don't even want to talk about it. Like, but. Like, I, I gotta mean, find some of these tapes. I feel like we were probably doing some of the same things in different areas. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I, with all the drinking that I did, anyway, and the 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 lifestyle that all of that perpetuated. You know, like I I remember putting my head through glass windows at parties, and then I, I think one time I remember going to a party and some girl had like two dollars worth of quarters stuffed up her nose, and everybody was. In the party, we had just walked in. And everybody was like all amazed that she was doing some cool fucking parlor trick. So, I, like, I was loaded, and I go like, "That's nothing. Give me those." And she gave me the quarters out of her nose, and I just like ate three dollars worth of change and swallowed it, and like was good for about three minutes, and then 
ran to the door and puked over some skinhead that was coming into the party. It was... <laughs> Were you puking quarters? No, the quarters come out the other way. And yeah. I, I actually was so panic-stricken that I, when I got home, the next day I called, like, uh, the poison control center, <laughs> told, told them that my kid swallowed, swallowed some change. What did they say? Just let it pass? No, the lady was, lady was hip that it was. She, she kind of went like, well, tell your kid <laughs> that, uh, yeah, that it should all pass. You know, like, it'll, it might take a while, you know, like. <laughs> but then did you elaborate that it was $3 worth of clothes? I didn't go into details. I just kind of wait, waited and counted it as it came out. <laughs> Loose, made, made sure 12 were there? Loosely, and then kind of watch out every time I, every subsequent time I've had to take an MRI since then, which is. Only been twice, fortunately. So, you're like, oh, I did eat some quarters. There when is I was that. Younger. There is that time that, like, if if change comes flying out of my stomach and sticks to the wall, it's- yeah, I, it's, it's a, as dumb as it sounds with MRIs, like because of all the cutting, and metal, grinding, metal, and metal filing. Yeah, I, like I'm like, I, I probably have a bunch of shit in my eye. You know what yeah. I mean? But well, whatever. Um, so yeah, so so uh, so Doc Buster uh, started up and. Um, and then, uh, yeah, right, I mean, that's, that's it, you know. I mean, we won the we won the rumble, right? So that was yeah. like a big that was a like kind of like a big badge of honor, I guess. At the time, uh, it was bands that went on to do some pretty significant things from the scene that that did, but there was also the curse that they called it the rumble. So I mean, I I don't really believe in curses. So so not all the listenership is going to be from Boston. So maybe explain what the uh, rumble so that was the rumble was a, a, a there was a local radio station well a syndicated radio station WBCN and they were real I guess that was they reached everywhere so they had like a, they would do every Friday they would do a top three local songs and then they'd do a national song countdown and they kind of really did the the idea behind the rumble was to expose uh, give bands from the area exposure and and uh, through voting and certain criteria, you could win. You win prizes for studio time, et cetera, that kind of stuff. Uh, I think they even had like an entertainment lawyer or something. It was a whole package of stuff. Uh, but subsequently, a lot of the bands that did win kind of didn't do what they had hoped. And the bands that came in second or third were the bands that went on to do some stuff, you know. But it was cool. It gave they so one of the things that we got to do was play. Uh, they had a, like a river rave was a big thing out at Foxborough Stadium. We got to play the parking lot of that, and then the hemp rally. I think was some of the big ev- events that were going on. So it definitely did uh, present us with some pretty cool opportunities. I think you know. Sure, I mean, and and, and you know, it kind of missed that because there's no really radio stations, or, as far as I know anymore, that are still given any kind of shine or spot outside of maybe college radio shine or spotlight to, to, to local acts anymore. Like, I feel like, yeah, I feel it's tougher and tougher for them to do. You know what I mean? I think like the, you think they'd be turning to that since like, there's le- I mean, I don't know. Maybe it feels like there's less and less people tuning into regular terrestrial radio. No anymore. doubt. No doubt. And I think it's, it's, it's the, the, that industry has had to adapt. You know what I mean? It's funny because some, it's, it's adapted and then some of the stuff has just gone it's regressed even, you know, yeah, if anything. Yeah. It's like the record industry, you know, like they're looking for answers now. They're not selling records. All of a sudden now we're selling records again. What do we do? Yeah, yeah. Like, okay. Well. <laughs> and I remember like, you know, like, you know, like, like like hardcore and punk and stuff and metal were the only ones like pressing vinyl and hip hop. And then and the major br- labels started coming back in and it fucked it up for everybody because then it took six months to get a record because there was only a few re- people pressing records anymore. And it was like, now now they got to repress a Steely Dan record. And, yeah. and, and, and so, you know, the stuff that, you, you know, used to turn around in a month now took like six months to get, you know, it was all jammed up. I mean, the good side of it on the, because somebody discovered that the collectability of it was, was cool. So yeah. like now it's because people were collecting vinyl for so long and, and probably not because it was on a 180 gram purple see-through vinyl, just because it was rare, you know, like sure. guys that we know, like, like, uh, like Al and the, in the drop kicks and, and, uh, bruises and Matt Kelly has got an amazing, the drummer and he's, these guys are a friend of mine in Asbury Park, Joe Kukas, who now has a record store because of all the stuff he does. He still goes down to Jamaica and, and buys old, old stuff off of those guys. Yeah, all the- I mean, he's living it and always lived it, you know? Yeah. All the old, uh, Reggae and ska stuff or whatever. <laughs> what, I'm going to throw up in your mic. <laughs> awesome. 
Hey, it'll be be the first one, second <laughs> second one in, and and for for everyone you know and uh, that doesn't know, Lenny is actually sober now, so that's not a yeah, but dr- it's, it's not a drunk puke. No, it smells like Johannes. <laughs> <laughs> it does. It's, his gold teeth, they, it lingers. Um, so yeah, so you know you had a run with Doc Buster, and then um, you know I, you know I know that things kind of went away with that and came back, but. Uh, you know, from from there, you know, you you have a very impressive uh, uh, career. You know, as far as you know, the street dogs and your own solo stuff, and you know, um, you know, uh, when did when did Doc Buster in its original iteration? When did that come kind of wrap up? Well, we did it. So we had our first chance to do a European tour. I think that was it. Must have been, I want to say, two thousand seven or something like that. <laughs> Does that sound right? Anyway, we did. We had a chance of Mark at MAD and a bunch of those guys in Europe were nice enough to put us on a tour with uh, U.S. Bombs and Van Creepshow from Canada. It was a Bad Boys for Life, kind of like one of the uh, annual kind of tours that they were having at the time. I think the Street Dogs had actually done it one one year before us too. And uh, I uh, subsequently had a real uh, bad go of it. About 10 days in, wound up in a in a nut house and without elaborating on that, it kind of, when I got back, it kind of changed the dynamic in the, the band and in my, to the, to those people's credit, uh, the, the other guys and girls that were in the band, my lifestyle kind of changed significantly after that too. So it, it was something that we never, never write it and never, we never really resolved it, you know? Sure. We did one more show a couple years after that, the Boston's asked us to do one of the throwdowns and we did that and it just, it didn't have the same feeling, even though people were into it. It just, it just didn't quite feel right. I think probably for everybody involved. Sure. And, uh, and I, I mean, I had done the, some other stuff. I had that piss pool boys band that I did in the interim. That was, that was fun to do kind of alt country kind of stuff. No, I actually remember seeing you guys. I used to, I used to, uh, skulk around the Abbey lounge a little bit. Oh yeah. And I remember yeah. like that scene when the, when, uh, like the Conks. Oh, yeah. And uh, who else was playing that? Well, there was speed, a band that had Speed Devils. Speed was, Devils. Yeah. They had the song about Schlitz, right? Yeah. Yeah. I yeah he even, Joe, the drummer in that band, actually had a Schlitz drum kit at the, t- at the time. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Chris was in that band, Speed Devils, too, for a bit. And he wound up playing uh, Pedal Steel with the Piss Pool Boys. And that guy that drummed on that band w- was a guy, Tommy Long, who was in the band uh, Dogmatics, the guys that I originally learned how to, like, I. Those are the guys that taught me how to play guitar. So I always wanted to be in a band with Tommy. He was like the Charlie Watts of the the cool of the cool, you know. Sure, sure. So so after that, you know, there was you know what uh, was Street Dogs next? I mean, I, I had so I we had done a bunch of tour like dates with the Street Dogs. We had done uh, the Wreck the Halls run with them. We did like eleven dates on on a couple of runs. So I had already kind of developed a relationship with those guys in the band and John and and. Uh, the whole gang. And, uh, yes, I, I mean, I, I guess I was doing the gang of one thing. I had done, did a, I did one record with the, with That's Pete right. from, from the Souls. It was like a little seven inch that Joe, the guy I mentioned from Asbury Park, put me in touch with, with Pete. And then John and the Street Dogs guys were, were uh, nice enough to ask me to do a run with them like that. It was, I think it was just me and uh, a, a mandolin guy and a, and an accordion guy, and that was like, that was one of the coolest tours I ever did because John, well, Rucker at the time was playing drums, saw us on the first night, watched our set, and came up to me afterwards and said, hey, do you th- I think I got your set. Can I sit in tomorrow night? Which I'd known, no, but I said, you got the whole set? Really? Yeah, but, but okay, if you, if you say you do, I mean, I'm not, who am I going to say no because you're awesome? And then the second night, John came up and he said the same thing, basically. Oh, you know, I was listening to that. It'd be really cool. You think I'd jump in and play bass with, with you? And by f- the fourth show, we were playing like a band that had been together the whole time. I've never since experienced anything like that, you know? So there was no practice. It was just right on stage, trial by fire, jump right in. I mean, that's to 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 Rucker and, and John's credit. It's it's something that's beyond me capa- capability-wise, you know what I mean? John, I remember watching John with the headphones on and he was just listening to the tunes the whole time whenever he had spare moment and he had that ability to kind of 
okay, I got it. Yeah. It's, it's crazy when you think of it, you know? Must have been pretty nerve wracking the first the first show like that though because you're like I mean not for me because I was doing it anyway with the other guys you know what yeah, I mean yeah. so it wasn't for me because I was just stoked that these guys that I admired would would want to do it you know what I mean and sure. and uh, and then you know fast forward that tour went on and I think we we really bonded all of us at that point and and uh, a couple years had gone by I think t- I got wind that Toby was going to step down from the Street Dog so I reached out to John and 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 uh, and he was real. He was real into the idea. He said, "Yeah, you know, like I was ready to try and learn the songs and go down and do a rehearsal." He said, "No, you got the gig. If you want the gig, I, I think you could have the gig." You know. So yeah, I mean, I think it took me a while to even be able to play the stuff because I'm a slow learner. You know what I mean? So I feel I always feel like I was the 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 weak link in the whole thing. You know, you're you're a pretty self uh, depreciating guy though. Like you obviously have an abundance of, of talent musically. You know what I mean? Like you're always kind of, it, and it's not a bad thing. It's a good thing to stay humble. You know what I mean? I it, feel like it, you're right, probably to a degree. When I go back and listen to the stuff afterwards, it's not like when it's what what's happening when it's happening. You know, I sure. always go like, ah, oh, it's not. It's like when you hear your voice, you know, like for the first time, you're like, oh. Sure, yeah. But it slowly you get accustomed to it, you know what I mean? Yeah, I probably won't even listen to any of these things, you know, like these podcasts. I never I do. If once, it's, once something's recorded, I'm, I'm all set. Really, yeah, with set it, it and forget it, right? But, but, but seriously, John and those guys for giving me the opportunity, that was a, you know, because like you think of things, people have a tendency to think of like what's in it for them type of thing. You know what I mean? So there was an, a certain aspect of like me thinking, well, this is, this could be good, you know, like, and, uh, and it really was, I mean, it was really great because it was a learning experience more than anything. It was a, it was a real good chance to grow up and learn what it takes to kind of be on that level that they, those guys were on, you know, like a full-time musician type. And, and like John always uses the, the term like pro, like he's a he's a professional musician like he's a guy that knows the ins and outs of the 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 behind the scenes stuff and knows the ins and outs of recording and and like I said he has that uncanny uncanny knack to just learn stuff on the fly and be able to do it so even though I still haven't got kind of up to 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 that level it's good to surround yourself with people like that and try and and reach you know sure. I've seen a few different iterations of Street Dogs, but I got to say the one, you know, the the last one when you were still in, uh, that always seemed like you, you guys legitimately seemed like you're having fun on stage and it was a oh, good we, time. And it was, it seemed like a really good, you know, and, you know, I saw with Toby and mm. other guys and stuff and, 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 and those were all great too. But I, I mean, that last, those last ones seemed like, uh, seemed like a jive pretty good, man. You know, It was I mean? good traveling in, in, into, you know, like in, in other uh, lineups, I would say before me, they were doing a lot more dates. There's a lot more pressure when you're doing a hundred, a sure. hundred sixty days a year together. And, and yeah. And you do that for a couple of years and you start saying like, what the, what are we, what am I doing? Like you were talking before the podcast about like the, the sacrifice that people make, you know? Yeah. I feel like nobody thinks about that until you're in it in music. And then it's like, Oh shit, be careful what you wish for. You know, like, yeah. Yeah. Oh, you're here. But, it doesn't, it's not all, it, you know, a lot of times people only see the glorious aspects of things and they don't, and, you know, any working musician or professional musician does see the, you know, is, is, um, or, you know, even in the motorcycle world or whatever world you're in, like, you know, people that are fans or people that are, um, on kind of like the outside of, of, of like the inner workings of things, see the more glorious aspects of things, but they never see the sacrifice or the of shitty course. times well, or the hard work. Or the- I mean, social media too, you know, has a way of, 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 <laughs> yeah. of putting a luster on things. You don't, you know. Well, everyone's life. It, Nobody's it, taking pictures of people rolling, yeah. rolling or carrying uh, road cases upstairs in a, in a, no elevator club in Germany, you know. Yeah, yeah, or, or smashed in a van, or or sleeping on a floor. Yeah. Or, or, I mean, it's it's believe me, it's not it's not everything. It's even people that think that they that they could do it or, or want to do it, uh, probably a, a high drop off rate once you get into doing it. You know. Yeah, no, I know. It's it's just the way it is. You know, it's 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 like they say. There's more perspiration than inspiration in it a lot a lot of times, you know? Yeah. And, and the same a, thing on the monetary end, you know what I mean? It's sure. not a – people think I'm rolling around in money because they see guitars and they see motorcycles on my Instagram page. Well, like, 
I've been I've been off the sauce for five years too. That's a significant amount of money too, you know. Sure, sure. That uh, I tell that with people. Like I have a lot of friends that like complain about money all the time, and they have like these like pack or two day pack or two a pack or two habit of cigarettes, Shit. and I'm like, you're spending twenty bucks a day, motherfucker. Thirty five hundred a year. Like I I was smoking a pack a day. I did the math. How I quit. Yeah. Because I started doing the math, and I'm like, I mean, I've tried to quit. I've smoked it my whole life, and I've tried a couple of times, but, like, I started doing the math. 3500 a year? You kidding me? That's like a, that's a car payment. Yeah. Or that's a a really nice guitar every year for four years. Sure. Or, it is. It is. And it's like you, 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 you get into that, and it's like, you want R.J. Reynolds to have that money, or you would rather put that money away? And I get that it's an addiction. Shit. And that there's a lot of shit in those cigarettes that, they're very vested in keeping you wanting those things. It's a, it's not an easy thing to break, but and it's a mental thing. It's always going to be cool to me. Keith Richards is always cool, but but I feel a lot better. I mean, I'm I'm coming on fifty four years old. It seemed like a no brainer to me, you sure. know. Like and it it's another one of those things. Just don't think that because you see on Instagram somebody fell into like all of a sudden it's it's some some former band's royalties sure, that are, sure. are, are, are putting, are padding my pockets, you yeah, know? Look at Lenny spending that street dog's money uh, now. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> the, the, other, the other one, but yeah, yeah you know yeah. what I mean? It's, it's, yeah, yeah. that's a lot of misconceptions in life. You just got to kind of, you got to, you got to keep your eyes on the prize and do what you want. A perseverance and, and kind of sticking to something is, is what gets you places, you know? And that's one of the things I respect. And that's one of the things that, you know, I wanted to have you on this podcast for and, and, and everyone that I kind of have, at least at first, it's, it's people I respect that put their time in and do something and, and see it through thick and thin, because there is a lot more thin than there is thick in a lot of these worlds that we do. And it's, it's almost like a drive, like, you know, we don't always want to do this, but that's just what we do. Yeah, like, I mean, know? I think that's how great things are done, anyway. Yeah, like every, everybody can hop on. Or you look at this, you know, like an, or or like talking to Johannes about tattooing. You know, shit. When when he started tattooing, or when my buddy Forrest, or like Jason Scott up in uh, Portsmouth. I mean, he was the only tattoo shop in Portsmouth. Now there's six. That's a lot for Portsmouth. Sure. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But in ten years, there'll be thirty. Or there'll be two. You never know. Once a trend dies, you know yeah. what I mean. It's it's you know like you got the you got the hat right here. You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, you know, it's just one of those things too, where it's just you know, it, you. I always have respect for people who are doing stuff out of passion, and and it's a drive and a passion for them, and they're doing it for the right reasons. They don't care. And I wish everybody that's like that, the most monetary and financial and whatever, whatever you gauge as success. Like I wish everyone the utmost of that success. And if you don't get it, the thing I respect is that they're still in the game. You know what I mean? They still do it, whether it's, whether it's financially rewarding. It's kind or, of a double edged sword too. I mean, some yeah. of the, some of the people that get to that point in music anyway, you know, that have, have everything that, that, somebody could possibly desire well they they're pretty lonely anyway with all of that i think that's a, a a misconception too you know oh yeah sure no but but you know then you got to give respect to people that do get that level of whatever commercial or financial success but then they're still doing uh you, you know you you'll see like um, bands that'll still do like they'll be huge, but then they'll still do like secret little like club shows yeah. or whatever, just yeah. to kind of get back. Or even someone like Lars, right? He's Rancid got one of the fucking hugest punk rock bands ever, but right. he's still doing Old Firm, or he still goes out and plays with Last Resort or whoever. Exactly. You know what I mean? I mean, he's, he's he'd be doing it if he was if he was playing a a squat in freaking yeah. Oakland. You know, I mean, it, so yeah, someone who's like with one of their bands, they're playing in front of 30,000 people. The next day they're playing in front of 200 people. I mean, again, I think equally as happy. You know? That's 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 about keeping it real. You know what I mean? That's what you have to do to 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 have some perspective in the in the world. You know, like I distinctly remember not too long ago in my life, not really getting my head around that and thinking that, you know, oh, this is this is how things are going to be. You know, this is great. You know, like. But the the sad reality of that is like that's that's not what drives me. That's not what I I want anyway. I mean, I think that was part of significant part of my mental break. Actually, you know, just living, not appreciating what I was doing. You know what I mean? And now it's it's I'm so appreciated uh, appreciative to be able to make music and kind of be to have learned those life lessons, you know? So what do you think back then made you not really appreciate what you were doing? I know you just got brought out to Europe. 
Yeah, mm-hmm. well, for me, I mean, I think that that prob for me personally, I think that that was a, a lifelong kind of. I think that the 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 drug addiction and the booze and all of that kind of really really blurred my vision, my my inner inner feelings. You know what I mean? Sure. I was just I covered everything up, and I didn't have a chance to really appreciate anything except for the the party or the fun that was involved. The fun that was involved in it. You sure. know. You weren't really able to process anything other than that because it's you're it was just distracted. A pa- yeah. It was just a party. I mean, really, that was life for me. You know what I mean? It was it was the, making music and the opportunities and all that. First off, was secondary. So even if it was an opportunity to potentially do something bigger or better with a a label or a tour or anything, I wouldn't even have been capable of doing it. So it, you know what I mean? It's there was no reverence paid to it at all, really. Yeah. Yeah. So coming out of that, even though you've been doing music the bulk of your life, it's when you kind of came out of that cloud of of the party that you really develop more of an appreciation for why you're actually the drive that's making you do this. Well, I mean, are you more in touch with it? Or I'm more in touch with myself and like and and uh, and what's what's a, a better place to be as a human, you know, in general. Nothing falls in in your lap. You know, you got to work for everything, you know. I feel like I worked, I still work hard to stay sober and all of that. And it's a, it's a, it's a path less, less walked than, than most, you know. It's not always glory. You have to process things. But I've had to become an adult about it. And I've had to look at things in a different perspective. And that is generally, they, you know, you'll hear people talk about higher power a lot with, with recovery in that, in that aspect. And I came to the realization that music always was my higher power, always was there for me. I just maybe wasn't giving it the attention that it deserved, you know? Sure. So now it doesn't really matter. I'm right back. At, I'll, I'll play a barbecue. I'll play anywhere anybody wants me to play, and I'll have a good time doing it, you know? Yeah. Well, one of the things I respect, too, like, you know, and I know everyone has their own path, and I've fortunately never been in a situation where I've, you know, where things have been so bad that, you know, I got a... a I'm lucky in that, like, I didn't start drinking until I was later, later in life when I knew I would be all right and not, you know, if you get into that shit younger and you go more fucking crazy and whatever. And I didn't, I didn't start drinking until I was like 30, dude. I like, know, it's you know, crazy. And then it was just like, then I was like, all right, I know I'm not going to fuck shit up too much. You know what I mean? And I just do it more fun and more social or whatever. But I always have respect for people because, you know, there's, you know, some people when they get sober, they have to step away from everything and they become a whole different person. Like you're still in it. You're still playing shows. You're able to maintain sobriety, even though you're around the things that might be tempting for people all the time. You're like, you're playing in clubs, you work in a bar as a bartender. Yeah, It's insane. You know what I mean? And well, then, so it, that's just a testament to the level of, of willpower. I mean, and, we drank together, you know, yeah. you know we've, we've partied together. You know what I mean? I feel like when I hang with friends, people that I know and love, and I, I'll fake that I'm going to take a sip off of something and I get a reaction from somebody like you or somebody else that, that is still drinking. They go like, no, like, no, that's not a good idea. That's a pretty good idea that it's probably not good, good for me to drink. You know, like, I'm still like the, the, the night that we were all in Vegas was still one of the funnest oh, nights. Dude. And I know it was a, it was a, it was a, one of the funnest, messiest <laughs> fucking nights ever, but it was, it was still a good time, but it was. And, and the, you know, we didn't even hang out a lot that night. It was like we were all together at the beginning of the night, and then everyone got separated, and then it was like four in the morning, and you came so disheveled, like glasses cocked, one one lens missing, fucking hair all over the fucking place, and we were like, yeah, let's go fucking, and then we all went out and drank after that, and I was like. Yeah, on the, I remember distinctly that's, that was a, you want to talk about a moment of clarity, as buzzed as we were, the sun coming up and us tossing beers 18 stories down onto the air conditioner. <laughs> yeah, or, people, or, or or just poor people trying to go to work. And I didn't even really know you that well at that point and, and just just knew you th- in passing. And I remember trying to, like, like be a braggart and boastful, like, I'm going to climb t- to, the, to, the, to the porch below or something. And everybody else was like, no, 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 I had one leg up. And you're like, no, let him do it. <laughs> and, and I looked at you, I looked at you and I'm like, Oh, the light went on. I'm like, no, no, maybe this is a stupid idea. If this guy's telling me to do this, this is definitely well, not I'm good. I'm glad I can be the sounding board uh, uh, in a roundabout way. No, bro, in, in more than a roundabout way, you know what I mean? That's a, also, like, I think 
it's just it's it's been a instrumental part of my life now knowing you and and some of the people that i know now you know what i mean yeah absolutely man i i we got a good circle of people around us and we're, we're lucky for that and one thing i want to ask you about like um that people might not know is the uh, the new england soccer team is the revolution and you actually got a chance to work with them and kind of develop the uh i don't know is it the theme song or what, what would you call it like the I chant guess like song a, or? A, like a yeah like a rally song or something kind of happened inadvertently because i was I was writing John and, and Joe uh, from Joe from the Boston's was playing drums. John was in doing bass and I had kind of basic tracks, but no real, no real lyrical content for that. And then they took off. I was still down for a few days trying to get some of that together. And uh, I had only like one line for that song in my head was sons and daughters of the revolution was like something that popped in my head. And then subsequently I kind of, just kind of chased that a little bit and it turned into like a, yeah, a little bit of a rally, a little uh, rally song for, for the local soccer team, which kind of, I did, I think even in the early Doc Buster songs at Skinhead, there was a Cheers of Revolution with his mates. I think that the, yeah, yeah, the team was like one, one year old or something when I did sure, that, sure. you know, but I did have a friend uh, that was working for the team. And uh, when I got a rough track for that, I, this guy, Mike Hammerick, uh, I, I said, well, maybe, maybe you want to just listen to this or something, take a listen. And, uh, and then he introduced me to a guy that's, uh, in PR over there. And yeah, it's, so it's, it kind of, it fell into a place where they can use it. They use it before games and stuff like that, which is really cool. I think, you know, they've been super, super nice and had me out to watch some practices and see, uh, the new training facility. And it's, it's nice to be to feel like you're a part of something like that anyway, you know? Sure. And I know Packer has season tickets f for the revolution and is wicked stoked on it. Is it, is it something that's, is that gaining some traction or getting, you know, is it, it's hard in new England. You I know think, what I mean? I for think the traction that, it, that it gained. So like, so now what I, what I noticed what they're doing on the, the media, the media side of things is they, they use stuff when they do their media clips for, it's more contemporary kind of, trap music or whatever the whatever you'd call it like it's it's supposed to be a segue it's not like a chant or like a rally kind of thing sure so that's what i was saying i got stress involved and in all of a sudden it dawned on me the other day looking at some some pre-game pre-season kind of footage that they had up i said well I, I know a guy that's really good at that why don't i see if i can get him the the raw stems and see what he can come up with so who, who knows where that goes? But I'm just excited to be working, like have stress actually working something, you know? Yeah, so they're getting away from the skinhead hooligans and trying to appeal to the trap? I mean, I think, I, I, I don't think that that skinhead, I'm just, I'm I don't just think like, that that, <laughs> I really don't think that the, any any soccer organization in the United States is going to embrace the, the hooliganism that goes on in Europe and understands that it's the same reason that they try and take fighting out of hockey, you know what I mean? They're sure, trying yeah. to normalize things. And... I mean that's good and it's bad. They got young kids that now. You remember when we were kids? They they couldn't even get a full roster of kids to play soccer on a high school team with me. Yeah, yeah. When I was in high school, you know, and now there's there's grandchildren of guys that I was in school with that have been playing since they were little. So it's 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 really developing, I think. But you're never going to get that culture that they have in Europe about it. It's yeah, I know. Uh, it's... Take it to the streets and flip cars is not really what they like us to do over here, you know. No. It's just if the Red Sox, or certain certain Red Sox, teams. even that they kill people with beanbags. Then you know, yeah, that's true. That's true. <laughs> welcome to Boston. Um, so, what's going on with uh, the new stuff? Um, I know you had a Gang of One record come out not too long ago, and I know you've uh, been uh, uh, playing. Uh, you know, with your you're, you're playing a lot solo um, as a one as a one piece. Yeah. What, what's what's uh, what's going on with music now with you? Well, I mean, it's 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 like by and large since I've kind of got that open to it, whatever opportunities come, then I, I, I kind of do whatever makes sense. Like, uh, if I, if somebody wants me to play and I can get there and play, I can play a lot of the acoustic stuff is really, I like doing that, but it's, uh, it just kind of developed as a, as a more fiscally sound way to do stuff. Uh, the people that I'm playing with now are all spread out all over the place. So to get everybody together to kind of do shows, it's not like we're all 40 minutes away practicing once a week. You know, it's got to make sense a little bit. So uh, 
but it's fun, you know what I mean? It's fun to do that. You know, it's, it's, a, and, and truthfully, there's some pretty cool opportunities that have, have come my way to do that. I mean, I did a gig in Santa Cruz opening for Cox Bar playing acoustic solo, you know what I mean? Who'd ever thought that, 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 that those two things would translate or I've done stuff like, uh, at some of the hardcore, you know, like some of the hardcore shows and, and, there was a woman, Kathy Cave, up in uh, Bucksport, Maine, that had a little hardcore uh, uh, barn house that used to have shows. And I remember going and all these kids just, like, stopping and watching. And it wasn't what they were there, the style of stuff that they were there to to, to watch, you know? So, Sure. Well, it's definitely striking. Like, when when we were at the uh, the um, the New Tradition show and you did that gig in Worcester, and it just happened to be in the same day, me, Packer, went over it was like a you know like a like a like a garage punk band playing before you, yeah. And then you came on, and and then everyone just stopped and watched. It was quiet. It was, it was quiet, but every but it's 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 a different type of like it just holds people. Uh, I mean, people's I think, attention. I think when you're doing that, if it's quiet, it's a good sign. It's just kind of unnerving when you when you you know like as sure. a as a performer, it's like okay, I mean, like make a little noise or something, you know, like. Well, I think with the acoustic stuff, yeah, it's exactly like you said. It, it's actually a better sign if it's quiet because if people are talking, that just means they're not paying it's attention. It's tough to hold people's attention for. I mean, there's a there's a certain attention span, finite attention span stuff doing that. Even if you were, I think even if you were Bob Dylan, probably you'd have only a finite time that you can keep people. But it was pretty smart how you did it. You played a few songs, kept it moving, then broke out. Yeah. Now, so with Gang of One, you're gonna do. You're gonna get the like the guys to play with you when it when it makes sense for like touring and then but it sounds like you're doing some of the, the solo gigs just by yourself too as a tour as well. I mean, I do the, so I got that thing coming up with Ruben. It's, it's like a like five day run that we're doing starting in Buffalo, uh, beginning of March, and then uh, I, I do it as it as it as opportunity presents. And I'm I'm fortunate enough that when I kind of started the project and called it Gang of One. That was originally, I guess, because I was doing solo shows and I hadn't been playing out a long time. And uh, and now it's kind of morphed con conceptually. So it's like, uh, I mean, I have a steady roster of guys that I would more than be happy to always only play with, but I also have kind of got to the point where there's some guys that are some pretty decent musicians in the Boston scene that will kind of fill fill spaces when other guys when it's not fiscally possible to bring the other guys in. So, you know, like we'll, I just kind of take everything as it comes type of shit, you okay. know? So, you, so you're getting the band together when it makes sense, but then yeah. you're doing it by yourself when, when that makes sense. Exactly. I mean, it's like, if I, if like we did a tour of the, the dropkicks uh, two years ago, were nice enough to bring us out for a whole run. And that, uh, and that made sense to kind of go out and get the, get everybody together and it, you know, hopefully everybody could, everybody except for me went home with some money. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, but that's, uh, like I said, that's part of being in a band. So like, sure, sure. and I and, don't, and, and, and it being your band, like, right. I mean, I don't regret any of that. That was, it was a tremendous opportunity. And I think that that's just the way I, I, I'd like things to be. Sure. You know, like I'm not going to, uh, to have anybody do anything that I wouldn't do myself type of stuff with the music. I want everybody to, that's playing with me to be happy and, and taken care of, you know, first and foremost. Is there anything new coming out? I, I One thing that I think is pretty cool is that Pirates Press, like your record's been out for how long now? The, the, uh, the it was, just, just came out. It's just like it'll be a year. Uh, be a year. Uh, in a couple of weeks, it'll be a year. But it must be doing because like it seems like Pirates either they're the best label or, or, or that record's doing good. They're still pushing the shit out. Of it. I tell you, and they're still putting new shit out from the, from the record, new I merch. Mean, it's, and, it's a and, combination of both, I think, but they, yeah, they, they are most certainly if, if I couldn't think of a, another label that I want to be associated with, because I think first and foremost, they believe in, in the people that they have signed and the artists and they want to first and foremost do that. And it's in, and, and selling units isn't the, the only thing that they're interested in. You know what I mean? Sure. And they they constantly are making new products, so that's the, the, that's what Skippy's really good at with the label and the people that work for him. Uh, uh, they do they did like a die cut single was looked like a postage stamp on clear yeah. vinyl and uh, they're still like they just advertised a new shirt this week. That shirt, yeah. I mean, it's like they, they, these. It, I think Skippy's very smart at, at the timing of stuff like that too, knowing what's going on in the political climate of sure. of, the, of the country too and. Yep. I mean, that's, 
it, it's great to be involved with people that have that kind of foresight because I that's not my <laughs> my strong point, you know. Yeah, you you make the music, not 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 handle the business kind of end of it, or, I, uh, or the, the the promotion. End even of it. the business, which are now by and large, I have because you I, you have to if you ask for help, you have to be prepared to to work to get the help too. Yeah. You can't just get out and say, "Hey, I'm looking for gigs," and not return emails and and and, sure. and such, you know. Yep. But I mean, I did that recently because I don't have anybody booking, and it looks like this year I had a, I mean, I had some really wild potential stuff come. There's a guy in in uh, in uh, Ecuador that talked about maybe bringing me down for a week. He's a school teacher. He was talking about, you know, what do I need for money? How long would I like to stay? That kind of stuff. Uh, Seems legit, you know what I mean? And I get a chance to maybe see Ecuador, which would, would be pretty cool, right? <laughs> it's either Ecuador or the biggest, like, catfishing campaign. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, uh, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Well, no, but you know what? It, it, that's one thing that's crazy to me is that a lot of my friends that are in bands do tour, like, South America pretty regularly now. Like, you never thought that that would be, like, a main circuit. For- it's the, it's, it is probably the circuit now, you know what I mean? As far as people that are, that are, it's like... They're a little bit behind, maybe, on the music scene, like where we were when it was really good or something, you know? But they're also, like, in that stage where they're, like, 100%, like, super over-the-top appreciative of anyone love, that goes they love down it. there. They love the, they lo- anything that has heart. They really connect with that kind of stuff. And they, it's a, I feel in Europe, too, a little bit. They, they, you're not a dirtbag because you're older and playing music, you know what I mean? You're, you're, you're something to be appreciated. Sure. And, 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 you know, and it's always the case. It's, it's kind of sad that like where most of the music, I don't know how to say this, but like a lot of music comes out of America, but America is one of the shittiest places to tour as an underground band yeah. versus like, you know, the respect and the, um, a, not attention, but like the amenities kind of that you get when you go to Europe. But the it's peop- so much different, and those are the people that are in bands that are helping bands out. Though there's the difference yeah. is you don't see you don't see guys that are in bands offering to come to shows for bands that are out of town, cooking meals for people and stuff like that. And they get that a little bit because they want to perpetuate a, a a cool scene. And and you don't get if you don't put in, you know. Sure. Yeah. But it just seems to be a lot more support over, over there, there for sure. I mean, they want to make sure. I remember one of the last tours we were over there with the Street Dogs, and I went to the. I went to buy a Red Bull or something from the bar, and one of the guys that was working there goes, I, I will not, the day a musician has to buy a beer or, or a, a beverage in this bar, I will not work at this bar anymore. Like, <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah. The, that's how serious he yeah, are about Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think, too, I think there's a little bit more government subsidy of, of uh, venues or, or, Most certainly. Or, or events out there Most than, certainly than there, over here. There is, for sure. But what, I mean... Which is 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 great because you can you can learn you can perpetuate and then they they give back you know what I mean it's a more opportunity for sure like that. And one thing I've always liked about looking over in Europe is like the festivals that they have are so like asinine insane like you like like you it'll be like Madball and Iron Maiden and like Tesla and Dude. like you know Terra. For and three, it's like it doesn't even make sense, but it fucking works. And it's vegan too, or something. <laughs> and then, then, then yeah. you throw some vegan thing in there too. <laughs> yeah, uh, and tents and, and it, uh, yeah. One of the first ones we did on, with with the street dogs because that was my first real exposure into the bigger festival kind of things. I might have still been drinking at that time. The first one we did, and I remember being in like Czech Republic, and after we were done, kind of wander like let's go walk about on the in the grounds, and. uh and you're just walking through and just kicking bodies that are lying down in the field. Like you don't even see them in the dark. They just yeah. passed out on the, on the <laughs> wherever. And was it, uh, when I went out there, whatever, years ago now with blood for blood, we played a show. Well, they, they played a show in Czech Republic and the venue was in this town and the townspeople wouldn't let the people from the venue go out into the town they formed like a human line, like oh, yeah. a human chain, yeah. so that you couldn't, you could, you could go to the venue, but they didn't want nothing yeah, to do. Yeah, I mean, you I, I suppose going right. into the town, and it was like an old school town, but yeah. it was like a big, like looked like a bunker or some shit, like where the venue was. But it, it was a, it was a metal fest, and um, 
like I know it was like Blood for Blood and like Sepulter and a bunch of like uh, the, the 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 corpse paint death metal probably, bands. Probably depends on where you are, I suppose. You know what I mean? But I guess that that just, that's that's a worldwide anyway. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like they have the old. You're not gonna get in here and 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 you guys are Frankenstein. We're gonna chase you with the torch, yeah. torches out of the. Out that's of the exactly town. what it was. Yeah, like. and I mean, it was that's... like these like little old like babushka ladies and stuff with like the things on their head and everything. And they if they might as well had torches and pitchforks. Oh, yeah, but they they were like locked on. Like nope, you are not coming into yeah, this yeah. town. It was pretty funny. That was pretty cool. Like, but uh, uh, yeah, it was just it was crazy. But the venues are fucking nuts out there. The whole scene, I mean, is is pretty cool. Like, and and what they'll do, you know, like, like you go to. It's funny because I guess there are some 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 cities in the U.S. that now are adopting it. But I remember like there's a big there's a big campaign to like keep uh, subways and stuff like really clean and no graffiti and stuff like that in 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 Boston in, in particular. You know, as like you go to to Europe to Berlin, everything is graffiti and it's a it's it's beautiful and it's exciting and it's like why wouldn't you let people do this you know yeah but on the other hand like i lived in switzerland for a little while i lived in geneva and that place like every night the street cleaners came out yeah every night like the subway was so pristine i mean like, i feel you could eat off the ground of the, the floor of the subway yeah. differences in the eu you know yeah like, oh yeah, so yeah switzerland it's 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 uh it's is a just a beautiful. I mean, they're it's, it's they like to keep it kind of the way it is, you know. Oh yeah, it's you. There's no fucking around there. I mean, it's there's beautiful. no there's no moving there's no moving into Switzerland just saying I'm going to move in and live. Oh right? hell no! When I was there, I was working for the World Health Organization, yeah. right? I I had a job there, and I was like, I was like, damn, it's pretty cool. Yeah. What would it take to move here? They were like, you need an advanced degree, a hundred thousand dollars liquid in the bank, and a professional job. Well, now you know what it is, and there was no marrying. It's in. it's. it's Four hundred k in the bank now. Is it four hundred? Well, this is this is a uh, mid nineties. So, like, it, it's if you want to talk about a vetting process, because I think I feel like anybody that gets to spend any time in Switzerland and see how beautiful it is, yeah, will I'll almost a hundred percent go like, wow, I'd really like to live here. Yeah, of course you're there, and you're like, it's fucking beautiful yeah. here, and it's cool, <laughs> and people are pretty nice. And yeah, no, whatever. they're great, and the culture is great. I mean, it, it, it's it's Switzerland and Austria, it, uh, like. Like it's it's spread out enough too. Like you can be in the city, but you can go and and be in the Alps pretty quick too. Yeah, you know? well, that's the thing. What I remember was like when I was in Geneva, um, I was hanging around with a lot of people that a lot of the people that were my age were like sons or daughters of like people that worked in some of those international organizations or but, diplomats or whatever. Yeah, so yeah. like I was hanging with people that were like half Swedish, half Tunisian. It was a, such weird mixes of people. Right. Um, and it was a very like kind of like European, but like also very international city. But you'd get on the get on the train, and you'd go out more towards the German side of Switzerland, yeah. and you'd go through the Alps and shit. And there was, I remember, there was a town called Zug. Yeah, and I remember being there, and I was like, just on the train, just stopped there. I was like, if I am ever rich, I am buying a fucking yeah, yeah. house yeah, here because yeah. it was the most beautiful place on it's earth, crazy. and it was like a little town yeah. just in the Alps, yeah. and just like the water out there is like super. I mean, clean, it's like, like the, it's like the Sound of Music. Like, yeah, it, it's, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's fucking crazy. I assume that if you live there and you get to, you, you get past that. Uh, He's the new guy in the neighborhood. Julie Andrews starts popping out in your backyard and singing, singing shit. Yeah, yeah, it's. It was, it's crazy, man. It's it's definitely different out there. But yeah, Europe's funny because it's like the United States, but going in, instead of going into different states, you're going into different countries, and there's different cultures and different languages and all that. So it's kind of weird. But um, yeah, any so what else is going on, man? Uh, you got anything new that you're working on or recording or plans for stuff? Or uh, you know, like I I I, I feel like I want to get in and record a new record this year, at least a new gang of one record. And I've talked to Pete from the Souls about maybe. Uh, producing that again uh, they're going to be that being said they're going to be pretty busy on a touring kind of schedule this year so I don't know when the chips will fall into place uh, right now I'm kind of just I, I got into doing some home recording and kind of uh, dove into that world a little bit so if I can get my technical ability to match what I want to I figured that would be a good way to do kind of pre-production and get uh, you know kind of take the bull by the horns a little with that you know uh, and that's what I've been focusing on, just kind of like coming up with ideas. And so I have more, it's always better to have more than less, I think, you know what I mean? And 
you bring a producer in, somebody that knows, and they can go like, well, maybe this one, not that one type of shit, sure. you know? But like you said, if you knock out all the pre-production or the demoing at home, and it's crazy, like, you know, like the the technology today for like recording, because, you know, I'm old school. I remember when my old band ITI, we were recording on like four tracks, yeah, like yeah. eight tracks, like, and then half inch reel, one inch reel or whatever, and you'd have to have this whole studio set up. And now look, we're recording this podcast on this little little box. Dude, I mean. And, and even more with like, you know. With your computer and just you buy an Apple computer or whatever. I'm not endorsing any brand. It comes with yeah. Garage Band. Yeah. You right. can do so much shit just with that. I mean, that's what I'm now. I I, I graduated from the Garage Band because it's pretty intuitive kind of. Sure. You, it's 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 user friendly in that regard, and then they have that Logic Pro, which is really. It's it's uh, it's it's like two hundred dollars for the program, and yeah. it's it's compatible with anything anything that even though Pro Tools will always be the industry standard, you know what I mean? You can line up everything to a grid and send files the same way you would on anything. Yeah, and, and even Pro Tools, like if you can navigate and learn on like GarageBand and then you can pick up Pro Tools after that. And I mean, just, it's the same basic principles, you know? Yeah. But the technology, like you were saying, with this thing that you have, that I am now using, uh, I think uh, Universal Audio has got this thing called an Apollo that I got. It's about a quarter of the size of that. And some of the programs that you can get in there are like, so a Neve, uh, like a Neve console to preamp kind of thing. When we're talking like a forty thousand dollar board or something, if you will, to pay the money on it, and they've simulated it so that that's the effect you get when you like you're throwing it through the chain yeah. or or Studer, or an old Studer two inch tape. Deck. It's a it's man, you could just spend hours and hours just kind of figuring out what to make things sound good, you know? Sure. And I'm sure for like a guy like you that's into equipment and pedals and different things, it's like a whole new realm of it's a toys worm. to play with. It's a wormhole, man. It's like, I'm glad I don't smoke grass anymore. because. Of <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that's the problem I find with a lot of this stuff. Like it gets too overwhelming. Like, like I, I'm super basic when it comes to this. Like yeah. that's why this machine's wicked easy. And then I can put it in and I have to put it into garage band or something. Cause I have to change it from, a wave to an mp3 and right. try and trim the end you know whatever i gotta do like but i'm not that good at it yeah. but like i can get get by right now um hopefully as this goes like i get someone that helps me with it like ian's supposed to help with the production stuff or, i mean i or, feel like you you pick stuff up anyway as you go right i mean i'm yeah. sure like when you got into motorcycles you weren't as good as you are with them no, now no you know no I mean? so we were talking about that like uh johannes was talking about like tattoo when you first get started and and you know what's weird is one of the first bikes me and jay built together as chopperhead is still on the road no and kidding. the guy rides it and it's passed hands a couple times, but you know, everyone seems to contact us and I'm like, dude, I don't know if you know that, but that's the first bike we built. That wasn't like for me, like first you know, one to sell. Yeah. Yeah. It was the well, first one we built together with the sole purpose of selling. Yeah. And I'm like, I don't know if I'd want to see that thing now and look at the welds, even though it's held up. Yeah. But like, you know, it's all MIG welded and you know, and I don't know what the fuck I was doing. But well, I, you know, barely, you know what I mean? But we, we knew enough how to make it safe and get it going. But the fact that it's still on the road 20, almost 20, it's, almost 20 years later is it's still pretty cool. But, but yeah, no, you know, it's the thing is, is like, but just going back to it, like the, the world is so crazy now. Like even with like War Machine, when we, American War Machine, we record our record, we record in Trevor's basement right. essentially. And it sounds like a record that's recorded in whatever studio someone's paying a hundred dollars an yeah, hour for. Exactly. And, uh, I mean, you, you, you too, but, but he knows the tool because the, the, what I meant is like all these tools are, are like there, but they're so overwhelming. You, like you said, you could get lost in the wormhole of it. So you really know how to do work it for what you're trying to do. And you know what I mean? And then you got to get into the not over, not like not overworking it. Yeah. You know what I mean, cause I have a tendency when I, whenever I'm doing stuff like that, I'll, uh, I think it's it's too cool. Like, all right. Like that's probably the alcoholic in me. Well, we got Jimmy's and, 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 and marshmallow on the Sunday. Why don't we put some French fries on there too? You yeah, know, it's yeah. like it's you got to know how to pare it back a little too. You know, it's, sure. Yeah, well, that's the thing, and so that's why, like, I almost don't want to get too involved in things because I'll stop playing with it. Oh yeah, I'll put this little effect here and this and that. It doesn't need any of that shit. That's when, it, it, like you said, it, when a record's overproduced, you know what I mean, or whatever. Like you know, like it doesn't need to be that way. It's just it's got to be at the. It, you know, it can't sound like shit, but you won't, you don't want it too overproduced. I mean, I feel either. like everybody's got different approaches to things, but simple is always better for me, you know? It just seems like simple, heartfelt, heartfelt intent in my life is is much better place for me to be. 
if I get too many tools and too many fucking things to mess around with, then then I start thinking I'm Einstein or something, and I'm I know I'm not. So or not only that, but like I said, you get too lost in like learning new shit or playing with a thing rather than getting what you want to get done. No done. progress, right? You just you just fucking around, right? Which, but at the same time, it's good to do that. Oh, to it's a fun point. as hell. It's fun <laughs> as hell. But I mean, it's like nobody wants to hear what it, no, like nobody wants to hear what I'm coming up with like that. You know? All these weird wacky. It's, oh, I saw your Instagram post the other day with the with the weird effect on the on the video, and I was like, oh, this he's, he's starting to fuck around a little too much. Well, that was <laughs> so I get I I, I usually I, <laughs> it was like seventies like yeah the little <laughs> lightning bolt going through it or whatever. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so Tony uh, Sell is a tattoo artist that I know, and he's down in the Keys, and the other, he's he's always messing around with new apps or whatever. And I saw he had like just riding on his bike in the Keys. But it had that uh, real grainy kind of old 35 millimeter kind of effect. Yeah. And there's this app prequel that he, I know. I It must have had like a watermark on it or something. So I was like, oh, let me look, see what this is. Yeah, you're right now. Like, <laughs> there's going to be a lot of videos of my dogs with lightning bolts <laughs> coming out of their eyes. And <laughs> or Lenny, Lenny playing uh, a, a guitar with a... Uh, with Purple lightning bolts. Per- yeah. <laughs> it's just great. <laughs> <laughs> the funniest app oh, I what, saw. That wasn't cool for crying out loud. I thought I was doing great. <laughs> I was like, oh, I'm going to have to do this welding or doing it with a, making something on a bike. But uh, I, um, the funniest app I found, and I can't even remember the name of it. It's like a superhero app. And so you can like put your arm out or your hand out real quick and it'll act like a lightning bolt or like a fireball's coming out of it. And it like shoots at like, and then you point the camera at whatever you want it to destroy. So I could have a, a video of me putting my hands out and it looks like lightning comes out. And then I point it at you. And then the lightning bolts hit you and it explodes and oh. shit. It's the dumbest <laughs> app, but I do it to antagonize like my interns or apprentices here at the shop or like the employees or whatever. I always like act like I'm like fucking them up. It like, sounds like a terrible tool to have. <laughs> oh yeah. It's so dumb. I can't even remember the name. No, of it, the best but. one too, I think is the one that stress turned me on to is that uh, spoof card though. That's oh, we, we, is that the one where you can change your number? So yeah. it looks like, like Donald Trump's calling yeah, here exactly. or, or somebody. That yeah. one is, and it, I think there's even a disclaimer now when you, when you get on it, it's like, you, you, you can't do certain things like they don't want you to do like government agencies. Right, they don't want you to do emergency call because it's pretty, it's pretty fucked up technology for sure. for the, uh, an average Joe to have. You know what I mean? Yeah, because I think about I think about a lot of that stuff. If, if I would have had when I was a kid, because oh. I remember once when we were kids, we called um, this kid we knew. His parents owned an ice cream shop, and we called there. And we said that the ice cream shop had like burnt down or something. Oh God! <laughs> and the kids, his parents were in Florida, and he called them, and like before he even went to check, he called them, and they started they like made arrangements to come back, <laughs> and they came back from the vacation early, and like it was like something happened, like it was too late by the time he went there and saw that it was like fine, yeah. and it was just a big fucking you know it was fucked up thing. But if I had the spoof card, it would have been even more, yeah, even more, really- even more <laughs> legit, right? Like instead of just going, you know, we were like, oh, this is office or whatever. Or then uh, you could call, from call his parents from from uh, you get his parents' number, you call from the airline. This is American Airlines, your flight's been delayed. You know? like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, and it changes the voice. It's just it's uh, oh yeah, the dumb shit we used to do, man. It's so crazy, the prank calls and whatever. I got one the other day at the bar, and it was the girl pulling the pulling the old Homer Simpson, like the mow at the. And she's like, uh, "Is my mother? My mother's there." And she threw one of the. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, I want a penis or something at yeah, me, and I'm like, yeah. "I need a kiss." Or whatever. Yeah, so yeah. I so I said it, and it didn't really, because I'm kind of dumb. It didn't yeah. really get like they got me with the mow, and then I, I said, "Well, wait a minute. What do you think this is? Mo's Tavern over here, and this is the Simpsons." And she, they all started giggling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know what though? You know where that came from. In the in the seventies, there were these guys, or maybe it was late seventies, early eighties, and there was a there was a bootleg tape going around. It was called the Bumbar Bastards. No kidding. And they used to call this guy Red at a tavern in in, in New Jersey, and like they, they would give him like brain aneurysms, like they would well, fuck God, with him too. so hard doing all that stuff, like the <laughs> fake names and stuff. But they would get him on rants. He's like, "You motherfucker, I'm gonna kill you and gut your mother." Yeah, rah, rah. And like it would go on, and they would, all they were trying to do is to get him to go on a rant. Right. But they were doing it with those fake names, yeah. and that's where the Simpsons got it from. But like I remember when I was a kid, I had a cassette kind of bootleg of it. And, uh, you know, it would, it would get pretty gnarly, yeah. like, you know, politically incorrect oh, or whatever, yeah, yeah. but it was fucking hysterical. They did that with the, the Darkbuster kids, uh, the, the two guys in that, they had a guy, Mitch, and that, that lived in Norwood, and they used to do that. There was, 
to get them all riled up. <laughs> And talk about uh, so maybe that maybe that's where they got that from originally too, you know? Yeah, well, and they actually made a a, a movie about it, and it was called Red or something like that, huh. and uh, it was like a little like an underground movie, and uh, Lawrence Tier- Lawrence Tierney or something he played the go- the guy, and it was, it was just something I just I, I don't know why like I have this useless knowledge, but it it, it has to deal with immature shit, so I'm a pretty good. <laughs> Uh, uh, you know, a pretty like- good resource of, of uh, immature, stupid uh, knowledge. But um, it's I, I got to dig it out now. That's that's what it comes down to. Like like I don't even think it ever made the CD. It was when you still bought like sets and stuff. Like, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean. So uh, we got to we got to. I feel that. like there's a bunch of stuff floating around like that. Have you ever heard the uh, celebrities gone bad tapes? No. Oh, dude, you got. I don't dive. even know what that is. You got to dive into that, dude. That's <laughs> a, such a world of. So it's a. Years ago, there was a band that we played with from Jersey, an Irish uh, punk band, The Skells. And uh, they turned us on to this. There was some some tapes of Buddy Rich, like after gigs, kind of reaming out the guys in his band and all that, that the guys in his band would just record like after a gig, put a tape, because it wasn't phones at those times, they'd roll tape and just listen to him freak out on other guys in the band. and <laughs> and uh, But eventually, somebody compiled a shit ton of that onto like a comp tape. So it's called Celebrities Gone Bad. And it's uh, Orson Welles flipping out, uh, uh, doing a commercial and, and is shit faced and flipping out at the, <laughs> like the direction of it. And, and John, John, you know what? I did hear some of that. I think they played it on like Howard Stern Dude, John or Wayne, years ago. John Wayne does a, a thing at like uh, UCLA and he's shit house out of his mind. And it's, it's the funniest side splitting. <laughs> yeah. It's crazy funny. Yeah, I, I never heard that whole thing, but I think I heard s- some certain pieces of it because I think they used to play a little bit of that on how The Buddy Stern. Rich one is just is insanely funny, too. I mean, he's just flipping out on, on what's it with the facial hair? You didn't hear me say, uh, I, I told you no facial hair. Uh, I can get high school kids that play better than you. Pull the bus over. Like, it just, he's <laughs> insanely, Insane, yeah. insanely terrible human being. Talented and terrible. I feel like that's a good. It's a good motto. <laughs> yeah, I think it's probably a good way to, to to end this right there. Anything else that we haven't talked about that you uh, think's important or or that that we missed or anything coming up that uh, that we didn't touch on? Uh, the winter psych, the winter expo at Sonia's. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. Well, thank you for 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 reminding me to plug our, our own event. But yeah, uh, for those that are listening, if you're in the New England area, we do have the winter moto expo coming up uh at uh sonia's in cambridge which if you're if you're old boston you remember as tt the bears uh it's part of the whole uh, middle east complex um it's a it's a small motorcycle show we'll have some vendors um some bikes it's just kind of a kind of break the winter cabin fever type of thing to get people out and about um and and, and now lenny's probably going to be there performing an acoustic set since he's <laughs> since, since he's the one who wants to plug <laughs> since he wants to throw the plug out there well you know uh, if there's an opportunity and you want me i'll be there bro <laughs> um but yeah so uh you know if if someone wants to uh get some of your music or find out what's going on with you. Why don't you throw out some of your own, uh, your, your website or some social media plugs? So, well, uh, on Instagram, really, I'm not into f- the whole Facebook thing. In Instagram, you can follow, uh, just Lenny Lashley. Um, it's easy enough to just type that in. Uh, I believe there's a gang of one page, but I don't really keep up on that. To be honest with you, uh, the Doc Buster stuff, there's a new Doc Buster page that, uh, Ruben is, is, is maintaining pretty, pretty well. And then, uh, and the best probably source of it right now, because the guys at Pirates Press are helping me get a a, a a steady website up and going. It's in the in the planning stages now, but uh, Pirates Pirates Press is the is the place that kind of has all the tour dates and anything that's going on. Is that PiratesPressRecords.com or I? I think so. I think so. <laughs> we come we come super prepared on this. I don't know. Like, <laughs> hold on, I'll call Skippy right now. <laughs> In the future with guests, I will make sure that they have all their. I probably script. should have done that. I mean, uh, I've done enough of these yeah. things, but I, I probably should have done it too. But well, we'll we can end with that. We can end with that word that begins with R and ends with D. Yeah, man, <laughs> we are both of those. But uh, but yeah, I want to thank everyone for listening. Thank Lenny for coming out, and uh, you can follow us uh, on Instagram. I'm at Big Truth or at Chop Ahead. 
uh, spelt like a, like a real masshole, C H O P P A H E A D, uh, chop ahead, custom cycles.com. Oh, that's actually, it's just chop ahead.com on uh, Facebook. We're uh chop ahead customs, uh, you know, whatever, just do a Google search for, for idiot and I'll come right out <laughs> <laughs> and whatever. And also, uh, you can find me, uh, doing laser tattoo removal at new skin tattoo removal.com and, uh, atomic ink tattoo. Uh, again, thank you for listening and don't forget to hit the subscribe button and, uh, go give Lenny a follow and pick up some of his music. He's on, you can get him on any of the digital, uh, digital platforms. I know yeah. you're on Spotify, yeah, Spotify, iTunes, the whole thing like that. Sure. And actually buy a record and buy some uh, merch that, that helps support more than, than, than any streaming could. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Truth. All right. Thank you. You guys have a good one.